You are listening to Redefining Rural, a podcast dedicated to celebrating, elevating, and changing the way we think about rural education in the state of Colorado and beyond. Download and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts, and don't forget to follow us on your favorite social media platform. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Michelle Murphy with the Colorado Rural Schools Alliance, here with my partner in crime, Kirk Banghart from the Rural Education Collaborative. Our third co-host, Daniela Platt, is off on a horse today, no lie. I don't know how many of you know she is a real deal cowgirl, so she is off on her horse this afternoon, and we are super excited to launch the first in our series around the power of in-person education with our one of our favorite superintendents, Leslie Nichols from the Gunnison School District. Leslie is on the Rural Alliance Board. Leslie has also served on the governor's COVID task force. So she has a real, she has a multitude of perspectives on the pandemic and the impact um, on our rural schools and communities. So Leslie, welcome to the podcast. We're so excited to have you and thank you for taking the time. Tell us before we get started a little bit about the Gunnison School District, your, your career, um, and the demographics of your, your families. Sure, thanks Michelle and thanks Kurt, great to be here. Um, I uh, am in my third year as superintendent here in the Gunnison Watershed School District. Before that, I served for five years as um, combined superintendent principal in Lake City Schools, Hinsdale County School District. And before that, I was in the classroom, um, middle and high school math, and before that English for about 15 years. And Hinsdale County is a frontier rural county, one of the most, the most remote county in the lower 48. Uh, and so that's the, the heart of my background. Um, and in Gunnison, I love serving this district. We have two relatively distinct communities, but that are incredibly tied together in so many ways. And Gunnison, uh, overall, our, our overall district population is about 2,100 kids. We this year with COVID experienced a 1.75% decrease in our enrollment, um, largely due to uh, preschool and kindergarten numbers being down significantly. It's very interesting at the same time, um, our Crested Butte schools continued this unbelievable growth curve. It's not a curve, it's like a straight line up of um, about 4% growth this year. Uh, and that has been incredibly consistent for um, over 15 years. And our facilities in Crested Butte schools are really feeling that we're working on that too. Um, the, we have about 40% of our students in the Crested Butte schools, about 60% in our Gunnison schools. We do also have a charter school over the hill, we say in Marble um, with about 45 kids. And that's a K-8 school. We have kind of two of everything, two elementaries, two middle, two high. Um, our ELL population in our Gunnison schools is, it kind of varies between 15 and 20%. So that's significant um, for us. And our free and reduced population in our, there's, there's quite a difference in our two communities. In our Gunnison schools um, is uh, over 30%, Crested Butte schools under 10%. So there you have it. There you awesome. Have. Well, thank you. So Leslie, would you tell us about how the, the what's been going on for all your different schools with regards to COVID, both in-person and out-of-person um, or remote learning, hybrid learning, those kind of things. We'd love to hear uh, how you guys have navigated the change in traditional education and what's happened for this the first semester of the 2021 school year. Absolutely. Um, our, along with many of our rural partners, we are thrilled to be able to say that we have been open for in-person learning since the first day of school this year. We have not experienced any extended closures, no closures at all. We followed our regularly planned calendar this year. Um, we have also offered a, what we call our Pathways Program, uh, which houses our online learning component. That was expanded this year. It has traditionally been a high school program of online courses, mostly for um, electives that we aren't able to offer and also for credit recovery. Uh, and then that occasionally had dropped down to middle school, but this year we, we expanded it down to kindergarten through 12th grade um, for online access. And about students 10%. are enrolled in the elementary component of the online. Mm. I'm always amazed by that. You know, it's really evenly spread out across 
all grade levels. We have about 10% of our kids uh, that dropped to just under 10% with second semester. Um, we had more kids return to in-person learning, yeah. but about two, 200 kids overall uh, for K-12. Wow. And we were surprised at how many elementary um, families chose that option, but at the same time thrilled that we had an option for families who felt like that was important or necessary for them during the pandemic. And it's been uh, very successful. We, we were able to accommodate some of our teachers with risk factors for COVID who were not able to teach in person by having them join our staff at our Pathways online program. And we feel like we got kind of lucky that the teaching skill set that we had ended up matching quite well the demands um, that we had for case management, we call it for our online students. Um, so opened first day of school in person. I think one of the reasons we have successfully navigated that since August 26th um, has been maybe twofold. I feel like we, we figured out early on that we needed to establish a COVID task force within the district mm -hmm. in end of April. And that work, uh, I th we had over 60 people um, in various kind of subcategories planning for how to, how to come back to school uh, through, through, through the summer. And the other element that I really think was a critical factor to our being able to do this was our partnership with our local public health authority. Um, I, I will never forget, it was some day in May, we were meeting uh, every day at leadership across this valley with public health, with incident command. And I asked our public health director at one meeting, I said, Joni, do you, do you think we're gonna be able to go back to school? And because we were planning all of this remote and hybrid and oh, we don't know how to do this. We've been doing it in an emergency setting since March 12th, um, but trying to figure out how to do that long-term. And she looks at me and said, yeah, that's the goal. <laughs> and I was like, I started crying and <laughs> it was um, something I'll never forget. And knowing that she had that vision which I had that hope and um, then was able to develop that vision and really land firmly in the knowledge that in-person school was essential for our students, for their families, for our economy, that in-person school is a public health measure and that mm -hmm. I, I have always known as an educator, but like working with Joni Reynolds, our public health director, really cemented that concept that when we are in school, our kids are in a safe space emotionally and physically and they're being fed and they're warm and they have this um, army of adults looking out for them and having relationships and support for them in ways that are just essential for all kids. Um, some have more risk factors in their lives than others and every single kid needs those adult relationships outside of their immediate family, I believe. Um, and so that, that public health and Gunnison Watershed School District shared that vision early, um, really kept us moving with strong momentum in that direction. Um, so we were able to make it happen. I guess I'd say one more leg, maybe to a three-legged stool would be our close relationship with our union. We do have um, mm -hmm. a strong union here called the Gunnison County Education Association. And um, I had not worked with a union before uh, coming to Gunnison Watershed and learned. So I was kind of, I don't know, deer in the headlights for a while when I started, but learned quickly how um, helpful that organization is for me as a superintendent to be able to have kind of a, a better finger on the pulse of what's going on with my teachers and special service providers are included in the union as well. Um, and then to partner in communications with the union both in both directions so that I can say to my union leadership, how, what's going on? Like, how are people feeling? What, what are the questions? What are the concerns? What are the fears? And then I could, you know, successfully create communications um, to alleviate those fears or to address those concerns or ask for more information. What do you need? How can we help? What is um, making your world really heavy or difficult right now? And I want this to be the best district to work in the state. What, what can we do to keep moving towards that goal even during a pandemic? And uh, that communication throughout the summer was also um, critical for our workforce to be ready to step back into their classrooms feeling confident. It wasn't um, super smooth sailing all the way through. Yeah. <laughs> like that was making it sound too easy. <laughs> I know, but there were lots of challenges and lots of really difficult conversations and hard meetings and 
frazzled nerves in all directions and feeling like it was really tough to hold the line that this is what we have we, we are called to do. We are called to make in-person learning work and we're gonna keep going for it. Talk a little bit about, you know, you did such a, a effective job of explaining, describing this shared vision in the summer around getting the kids back to school. But, you know, in the front range, we haven't been in school at all. My kids have been in school three, three days the entire year, although our fingers are crossed and we're heading back. I don't think I don't think you understand what an incredible accomplishment is. So I want to I want to sort of applaud you and your community for making that happen and let our listeners know that I think the vast majority of our rural schools have been in full time, maybe some rolling quarantines um, over time. But talk to us a little bit about some of those challenges. I think you did sure. a great job talking about why it's so important that the kids be in school and they're held and they're safe. But the challenges on particularly your teachers um, sure. administrators, how, how, what would those look like? And, you know, what was the key to getting through that? So I think one of the biggest challenges was trying to, I don't know, like a salmon fish up to upstream um, against the current because the current of national media, statewide media, even local data about COVID was, we had a, we had a mini surge compared to what we're experiencing now over the month of July in the Gunnison Valley. So that's when everybody's gearing, you know, mentally back up to be like, oh, we're going back to school. And our numbers were scary um, in the community. And to be able to, so that was a huge challenge to be able to convey to Team Watershed is what I call all of our employees, um, that um, COVID is a risk. We cannot eliminate this risk. It is an unwelcome risk. It is, it feels defeating. It is scary. And we can manage it. We manage risk in our lives all the time. We, um, we work in settings where flu and hand, foot and mouth disease and all kinds of yucky illnesses run around. Um, and we manage okay with those to stay open. And this is a bigger one and a scarier one, but we can manage it. And here's how we're going to do that. And, and so we developed what we call our risk reduction toolkit um, and I just feel like a broken record, but the, we have nine tools. It's kind of a lot of tools. I think three is more of a magic number, but we needed to expand that. Um, and repeating those tools, providing resources to make all of that happen. So we ask our staff to do daily health screenings. And then we, we do screenings of our kids when they get to their first hour or their elementary classrooms in the morning. We know it's not perfect because we're not keeping them outside of the building, but it's better than not screening at all. We take temperatures, we ask them if they have symptoms, we send sick kids to the office, they get sent home um, the whole nine. We follow some really strict but carefully developed illness protocols with our public health. Um, we wear masks, we wash hands, we distance physically when we can. And that was a one, that was another challenge because that, that has so successfully been conveyed nationally um, and in the media that that's an important part of, of fighting back against COVID that you stay apart from each other. And we said early on, we can't do that in our schools. If we're gonna be all in, um, our schools aren't designed for six feet of difference, distance, excuse me, between all humans <laughs> when we're all in the building. And we said, we'll distance as much as we can. And at high risk times like snack or uh, lunch, we will mitigate as best we can. We'll eat outside when the weather permits. We'll have only two kids per table in all of our cafeterias, which is quite amazing still to see that happening. But we knew we couldn't all stay six feet apart all the time and we just owned it. Um, we'll reduce contacts. We, we did not successfully cohort. CDPHE would, you know, they don't like hearing me say that, <laughs> that it's not, I, I, we didn't find a way to do it with our uh, secondary programs and we owned that one too. And we said, we, we can't figure out how to do our electives and our core classes with the size that we are and with the teaching staff that we have. And we're just gonna do our best uh, with the scheduling that we are able to do. We taught kids to breathe or uh, cough in their elbows, even with their masks on. We did purchase HEPA filters with CARE Act, CARES Act money to have in every single classroom and every single office. Uh, and then we also moved to a cleaning product called hypochlorous acid. I won't go into all the details, but it's a vol volatile organic compound, VOC free. We had a lot even early on before we closed schools on March 12th, we had increased our cleaning early and our ammonia including um, 
materials that we were using were causing respiratory irritation among many of our staff and kids. And so we, we made a switch. That was a big lift um, over the summer to, to a different uh, format. Are your teachers doing the cleaning in their own classrooms or? Yes. We did, we are paying for extra cleaning staff that we contract with, um, with CARES Act money again, or COVID money, the various kinds that we get. Uh, but it, it is incumbent on our teachers to um, sanitize at multiple points during their day. It kind of depends on their schedule, how often that happens. Um, and they also are doing a lot more basic kind of nursing things where they might send a bloody nose, even for example, down to the office, they don't do that anymore. They just deal. Yeah. We've given them materials and some guidance on that, but, but it, again, you know, they are nurses, they are custodians, they are mental health providers at levels that they haven't had to be before. Um, How are they doing overall? My teachers are superheroes and I tell them that all the time. Um, but it, my telling them that doesn't make it a whole lot easier. Um, they're, they're, they're exhausted. And we do embrace and recognize that our calendar as uh, K-12, pre-K-12 educators is a blessing. Having two weeks that we just had at, at the winter holidays was uh, really necessary and, and made a huge difference in people's ability to continue to show up under these circumstances. I think in addition to like the nursing and the um, cleaning and the uh, everything else that kind of just the logistics of COVID requires. Our teachers have done a huge lift with technology this year, and we launched what we had begun to chart out over four years to get to one-to-one -one preschool through 12th grade. We did it in 2020 over the summer, and we used, again, CARES Act money to purchase devices enough to go one-to-one -one immediately. And last summer, we conducted a blended learning cohort with over 40 teachers, K-12 or preschool 12, um, both ends of the valley participating. And then those teachers who had kind of this boot camp about blended learning um, took that knowledge back and they organized uh, small groups of teachers, you know, like uh, job teachers where they were able to spread that knowledge and support one another in figuring out how to revamp their approaches and their curriculum to house materials in Google Classroom to change up how they design instruction so that um, it takes advantage of digital tools without being overly reliant, um, but also giving kids those skills because at that point we were just ready to have to go remote at any moment given what could happen with the virus and we never had to, but we, we felt well prepared for that uh, in case it would happen. And so that one-to-one -one and the blended learning strategies has, I've had so many veteran teachers say to me, I feel like a first year teacher all over again, that this is so like challenging and mind blowing and I'm having to recreate everything. Um, and, and most of them have come around and been amazing and said it's been one of the most challenging but exciting years of teaching that I've had to have, I feel like we've supported them relatively well um, in, in that heavy lift. So I, I think it's it's very unique, Leslie, to hear you talk about the 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 partnership that you had with your your county health, and that's fantastic that you guys had that shared vision. Um, talk to us about how the community has responded um, to that idea of saying in person learning was so critical, and that that needed to be the focus. Yeah, um, I still meet with our incident command team of valleywide leaders twice a week, um, and. Every time I just came off a meeting where I was asked for an update and I said, well, we're still open. We've been open since the first day of school and everybody claps hands and cheers. And I mean, the support is just crazy. And those are local government officials plus uh, kind of leaders of like our hospital system and Western Colorado University and Crested Butte Mountain Resort, Vail Resorts, um, obviously a big employer in the Valley. And uh, the support from the community continues to be strong. Um, I, I don't know what else to say. Uh, people tell me time and again how they don't know what they would do after we had to close for the emergency last year from March 12th through the end of the year. Uh, they, so many have said, I just, I, I couldn't have done that again. I, I would have lost my job. I would have not been able to pay rent. I, I don't know where we would be. We probably would have had to leave the Valley. Um, and it, 
those stories are gratifying uh, and knowing that there's many more stories out there matters too. And, and we feel a lot of that support. That's great. So, so when you when you look at the the last nine nine months of of doing it, um, what do you hope to take away and take forward into the next, so that we can continue to increase the power of in person learning? What lessons would you give for this? What's been happening for you as a district, and that you would take forward into the future? So, one of the things I haven't mentioned yet is that our task force quickly identified that next to physical health and safety, social emotional health needed to be our second priority. And that meant that we put that ahead of academic growth and achievement. And uh, that was a hard pill to swallow, even, even for me as we got closer to school opening where I was like, wait, okay, if, I'm, if I have said that social emotional support and learning and growth is that important, that means that, okay, we're gonna push back our MAP testing window a few weeks in the fall. And we're going to spend that time building relationships and dealing with the trauma of the pandemic and our closure in the spring. and um, getting to know each other in ways that we haven't before and practicing restorative circles at a level that we haven't before across the district. And so that prioritization, I think we've always known how important what we do in person is because when kids have relationships with their teachers, their counselors, their elective teachers, um, that's why they come to school <laughs> is because they know they're loved and they know that they have people who spark their curiosity and, and keep them excited about life. Um, and so I think we knew that that was that important, but, but that we put it on a higher level of kind of a spotlight shining on it. We're going to continue that. Uh, and we're excited. This year's focus was on adult social emotional learning. And we've done uh, quite a bit of professional development that I always want to say we could do so much better, but we are doing it. Um, we have groups meeting regularly through the year to teach and, and just provide support for our, our staff in their own growth, social emotionally and their own mental health. Um, and so we hope to develop with our community partner in juvenile services uh, through Gunnison County, a strategic plan for um, that work over the next five years. And, and we hope to have that by the end of the school year. I, I'm, so that's a huge silver lining is just the formal acknowledgement that we know we've always done this as in-person K-12, pre-K-12, and we're gonna keep doing it. The other thing I would say really is this blended learning model where um, as much as it was pushed and prompted and demanded by the threat of having to go remote again um, to remote learning, we have come to embrace and understand that, I mean, these are not new words, but our kids are digital citizens. They are digital natives. They're born into this world where the internet is ubiquitous. And if we're not giving them the tools to um, be critical thinkers about the world that they live in, in that regard, we're not doing our job. And so our one-to-one -one program and that our teachers are integrating digital tools successfully. It's not the everything, the relationships are the everything, um, but, but that model of teaching and, and for our kids to know how to access that type of content, um, we also recognize as a long-term improvement that will keep going. Well, you are a superstar. I don't, I don't know that you know that. You are a superhero as well as your teachers. You're, we are so grateful for your leadership in Colorado on the Alliance, just everything. You're so generous of your time and you're a mom and all of those things. So thank you, Leslie. Thanks for being here. And um, Thanks, yeah, Thanks, keep up the good work. We're, we're in awe. Thank you both for this opportunity. It's gratifying to get to share it all. I really appreciate it.